This is Lab Medicine Rounds, a curated podcast for physicians, laboratory professionals, and students. I'm your host, Justin Kreuter, a transfusion medicine pathologist and assistant professor of laboratory medicine and pathology at Mayo Clinic. Today, we're rounding with two transfusion medicine fellows that we have here at Mayo Clinic, Dr. Nidhi Kataria and Dr. Thane Kubik, to dive in to talk about how to optimize that residency experience. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks Thank for having, having us. us. <laughs> Absolutely. So I, I really am always impressed by you guys, uh, how you, throughout this academic year, you see residents come through and rotate through transfusion medicine, which can be a very challenging uh, environment. And I'm kind of curious, you know, what information perspective do you think is important for residents to understand about where to put their focus, their energy uh, during residency training? That's a great question. Uh, so we know pathology residency is like a demanding journey <laughs> in itself. And like anything else, basics come first. So getting your basics right, getting your fundamentals right is the first thing to start on. So when you're in a pathology residency, what your fundamentals are? You, you need to know how to grasp specimens properly. You need to preview cases, preview cases, as many cases as possible. That's what my seniors used to tell me. And that's what I feel like helped me a lot, both in terms of being a uh, practicing pathology and even for the both. So those are the basic skills that you need to acquire. And even for the clinical, like you need to understand the di different diagnostic entities or like how do we come for a patient care decisions if you don't have your fundamentals right you would not be able to get to the proper decision that is the first and foremost thing to start your residency with and that just doesn't end in the beginning like you have to keep this practice going mm -hmm. uh, another thing I feel like which is important along with doing your hard work to so that is doing your learning is research, which is another important aspect of pathology residency training. Whether it is just for like your own CV and your own interests, but you also need research to build your CV for fellowship applications, to get a job in the future. Uh, so you, you need some kind of research. And how do you do that? Like you get into residency, you may have some experience, but we and like when I got into residency, I didn't have experience with research. So I had to ask, get in, I had to ask my seniors. I went to my program director. I did a residency training in India too. And I went to my program director and I was like, I want to get involved in research projects, but I don't know where to start from. And I was like, plain and straight. <laughs> wow, you give me so much. Let me put a pin in the research topic for a for let me circle back to that in a little bit. I really want to kind of dive into, you know, your your highlight of kind of the fundamentals and the basics. And one thing I'm curious about is, you know, how to approach this with, uh, you know, learners, you know, junior residents that are, you know, just coming on or just coming on to clinical pathology rotations now. I imagine that for anatomic pathology, uh, maybe that's an easier thing to define or put your finger on because you could think of like, okay, histology, I need to really have a good understanding of histology and be able to identify my subtype, cell types, be able to identify the architecture. But I could see maybe it that being a struggle in the clinical pathology world where maybe the fundamentals is like clinical medicine. <laughs> <laughs> which can almost get beyond what I can get my arms around. Do you guys have thoughts on like, what is the fundamentals in, in clinical pathology uh, rotation look like? Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a really good question. Like you said, it's, it's quite a bit different and quite a bit more nebulous. And I find that um, one, one thing that we were going to mention before was talking about sort of the hidden curriculum a little bit which is maybe not like, these are the sets of entities that you have to look at and learn. I feel like on the clinical side of clinical pathology, it lends itself more to a bit of this hidden curriculum. So things that aren't you know, gonna be in a syllabus, but it's sort of like the teamwork sort of things 
you know, especially in clinical pathology, you're interacting quite a bit more with allied health professionals as well. So it's really important to find good mentors, good role models to kind of see how they approach challenging calls and really to help have them guide you in sort of that like apprentice um, and learner um, sort of relationship so that they can really help highlight what are the more important things to kind of key you in on as well. Because otherwise you're quite right. You know, it's like, this is all of academic or clinical medicine, you know, go for it, you learn what you need to know. So I found from my personal standpoint, finding those mentors to kind of watch their practice, kind of see what things they key in on, that's really been helpful to me as well. Yeah, I really like that because that is that does sound like something I can get my my hands around, right? Back thinking back to where I was as a junior uh, resident, um, and then what do you say about kind of that frequency of like, is it kind of like at least once a day when you're coming on a new service that you're kind of checking in with with mentors and and asking about you know how am I doing and this is where my thoughts are on X, Y, or Z. I don't think there's a defined frequency, like based on what, say, like if I'm look if I'm on call for a day, hot seat for a day, as many times I'm getting like some kind of difficult calls, which I'm not confident with, I would approach my consultant or my mentor and see like, this is how I am thinking about this topic. What would you, what are you thinking about this? So I like that, right? So I highlighting for our audience, right? Whenever you, the uncertainty, you're like, oh, this, this is new territory for me. Or I guess maybe to your point uh, is like, maybe it's uh, a new iteration. Like you've handled similar calls before, but this one's just a little bit different. That, that might be a nice time to check in with faculty. You know, I, I, you guys have both, oh, sorry, were you gonna add? Yeah, I was just going to add one thing. So checking daily is helpful, but I find that like having some sort of reflective practice in residency is important too. Listen, journaling isn't for everybody, um, but having some way of kind of keeping tabs maybe over the course of a week to kind of figure out maybe where you've struggled and then having that, you know, like 10, 15 minute redux that's set away from busy service work to sit down with the faculty mentor would be really helpful as well. And then you could try to think about some themes or kind of general ways to approach things. So it's not just one call, one itty bitty fire to put out kind of at a time sort of thing. Are the, you know, diving in that Dr. Kubik, do you think there's, um, you know, you mentioned that, you know, journaling isn't for everybody. Uh, <laughs> certainly that's a way that my, me and my younger daughter are connecting these days <laughs> is, is doing a little bit of this um, bullet journaling type of thing. Uh, you know, what are some of the, the diversity of practices that you've seen maybe different types of residents do that, you know, still is this kind of uh, reflective practice? Yeah, I think so here, on a busy service that we've had, I find that um, with a couple of trainees that have come through, or I should say learners, um, I would just sort of flip through their on-call kind of notebook throughout the week when things sort of die down and say, let's go through this. Was there any other call that you kind of wanted to chat about that didn't quite go as well as you wanted to, or that you feel like you didn't quite answer well? Let's chat about that now. So I find that's kind of one way to do it have a record of something and then go back to it and revisit it because it's really hard to pull you know examples straight out of the air <laughs> just to add to it like something what i to try to do is uh like i would try to self-reflect i think this is something you taught me on what i have done in that week and how i achieved like the things that i were trying to achieve so it's easy like if I'm practicing transfusion right now, it's transfusion is a vast word and it's easy to get lost in the sea of clinical service. And then are you learning new things? Are you achieving your targets as well on the side? That's important to realize that. So reflecting back on this past week, what you have done and then setting up goals for the next week so that you, along with your busy schedule, you can fit those goals in. That helps a lot. And that's really interesting. That sparks in my mind. I think you're highlighting, Dr. Kataria, this issue of, you know, every training program is 
going to inherently have maybe blind spots or things you may not necessarily be exposed to or maybe exposed to a lot of, right? But by having this thoughtful practice that you describe, you can catch that uh, or have that look into what's in your blind spot. And so then have a targeted approach for how are you going to work on that? You know, sitting down with a, a mentor, for example, and, and having a conversation about, geez, I haven't seen the cases like this, but what are your, you know, how, how should I approach that? You know, one thing, next question I have for you, uh, and again, this is at the end of your academic year, so you've seen a number of, of trainees come through, both junior residents as well as senior residents. I'm curious, um, having worked with several of them, are there a few common challenges that you've seen that they kind of might run into when they're on transfusion medicine uh, with the idea that the listeners can kind of be kind of heads up about this and, and anticipate these challenges? Definitely. Like, I think as a resident, both as, as a fellow, like there are a lot of challenges, especially that there is there are gaps in medical school and pathology residency. Uh Pathology residency basic skills like histology, grossing, and then transfusion medicine, they are not taught in the medical school. So once you actually start your residency, it becomes challenging. It becomes simply overwhelming. And I remember when I started my residency, and like as physicians, we want, we target for excellence. Uh, you, I started feeling overwhelmed. I wanted to know everything. <laughs> on day one or in my day on my my first month and it was just putting a lot of pressure on me and that I had to talk to my seniors and like bring the self-realization that I cannot learn everything in on day one and it's going to be a journey and we are lifelong learners <laughs> so I get you're saying that uh pathology trainees maybe uh partially selected for perfection perfectionism <laughs> as a character trait. <laughs> so how, how might, uh, are there ways that you've kind of, uh, when you recognize, wow, this person has got, uh, you know, and it's nice to follow uh, protocols and the like, but where maybe the perfectionism is getting in the way of uh, moving forward in practice, how, how do you help that person overcome that barrier? Yep. So I think grad, just a sense of graduated responsibility and self, people that will tell you that, but first of all, self-realization of that is extremely important. Uh, be compassionate to yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't be too hard. Like, and that's, we as physicians would show compassion to others, but we often forget self-compassion and that is a skill to learn. And then just realizing that this is a journey and this is not like one day task or one month task. And everyone is in the same boat with you and we are here to learn. Learn, like celebrate the, every day. Like I learned this new entity today. I learned this new thing today. So achieve, enjoy yes. those victories. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the ways that you guys have seen, like you're, you're talking about um, this, uh, you know, uh, I think of it as, um, I think you said that you were compassionate to each other and that that was a skill to be developed. What does that skill look like? That's a really good question. I think... Part of that is something that you can model off of um, just good, like general professionalism, I would say. So we all kind of work. Um, pathology doesn't exist on an island. We work with a lot of allied health professionals too, whether they're pathology assistants in the grossing room, you know, our clinical teams that we're phoning a lot about, you know, additional platelet units uh, and transfusion medicine, et cetera. But just always sort of being humble and um, really that you're trying to work the best and do the best possible job for the patients that you're looking after and recognizing that you're going to make mistakes but if you approach it with humility and an inquisitive attitude sometimes by saying hey I don't really know how to approach this but can you help me out can you point me in the right direction I feel that 
outward professionalism and compassion can then be um, sort of mirrored and then imprinted on yourself a little bit too. Yeah, I like that. I, I see that uh, quite a bit. And, and that does, I think, come across as a skill, something we all can develop and, and get better at. Uh, and I'm sure you probably have seen various mentors kind of approach that in, in different ways. Um, maybe if I flip the uh, equation around to the other side. So we've been talking about maybe where are some challenges that you guys have seen and, and talking about perfectionism, talking about how we can realize it's a journey, breaking it apart. You guys have been talking about a lot of really powerful ideas. Um, what are you, when you think about people that uh, maybe uh, senior residents that have come through that are just knocking it out of the park, right? What, what are they doing? that maybe uh, some of the others of us uh, need need to learn? What what are the really successful residents uh, doing as a matter of habit that's helping them be so successful? You can go first and then yeah. I'll add. Yeah. Uh, be consistent. Like you, as we have been saying, like it's a journey. So like be disciplined and be consistent not success is like, there is no, there are no shortcuts to success. Uh, if you are doing something every day, by the end of three or four years, you would have acquired that cumulative knowledge and that would really help. And then also know like what you are supposed to do. So, like if you don't know, you may be just lost in this vast sea. So talk to your mentors, talk to your seniors. And if you are in a certain rotation, I try to make sure like I would sit with my the rotation director and understand what the objectives are, what would be the best resources to go for that rotation uh, so that if by the end of that, I should be at least achieve those objectives and maybe even have like more knowledge about that uh, topic. And then also one more thing, like having a proper system to do things. Uh, I think in like we see so many residents coming on transfusion service and often we see that like if you don't have a proper system to follow up on things you will you, your follow up list will never be complete and especially You're like com <laughs> coming from the clinic busy clinical service like things will get lost to follow up and there would be trouble <laughs> so having a proper system in a place helps prior and prioritize your tasks if I can hop in there really quick and say, like riffing off that, uh, oftentimes uh, newly accepted fellows will ask me about like, what do I need to do to prepare to start fellowship? You know, which which transfusion book do I need to be reading? And and I always just recommend, uh, you know, we'll we'll deal with that stuff. But you know, the biggest thing to work on is what is your system for capturing the to do list and working through that. I think that that structure brings what you're talking about about consistency and this idea that you can be relied upon uh, to follow mm -hmm. through so strong. Uh, Dr. Kubik, what are your thoughts about, you know, what what uh, those highly performing residents are doing that rest of us can learn from? Yeah, so I think, you know, there's a big change that happens, you know, in the early years of residency, and then sort of as things transition towards your senior years of residency, at least it should, I think. And I think that this is part of the hidden curriculum and where people who really start to understand this can really start to do an amazing job. And what that is, is really, you should kind of look at the final years of your residency as a transition to practice, I would say. By that point, you should be focusing not just on the entities anymore and like learning the skills and how to chat with clinical teams, but really starting to look at how different pathologists, transfusion docs, whoever, how they practice and how you're going to emulate the way that they practice, you know, into your own um, unique kind of flavor of practice going forward. So the residents that do really well, they'll sort of kind of be pick and choosy about, you know, okay, from this attending, I'm going to take this skill or this presentation technique or this way of approaching this particular problem and then develop their own style. And I feel like nobody tells you that you have to develop your own style kind of along the way. But ultimately, it's going to be you making the calls at the end of the day. 
there'll always be backup to some sort of extent, you know, whether it's through quality assurance rounds or knocking on your colleague's door or whatever. But at the end of the day, you should be an independent practicing pathologist, transfusion doc, whatever. And you have to use that time kind of in your senior resident years to kind of develop what your own style is and your level of comfort. I, I love the way you put that because I, I see that as really kind of somebody developing a sophisticated medical practice, right? It's not just, you know, can I diagnose this? <laughs> but you're starting to recognize the nuances and the differences that is this thing we call clinical judgment, right? And like, uh, how how are we appreciating how different mentors are applying this and having a sophisticated way of taking from some, leaving from others, and building who we are as as individual uh, clinicians. I really like that. Now let's rotate back. I put a pin in research because um, I know that's always a, a challenge. And uh, you know, for for our audience that are just starting uh, residency, I hope that this has been a really key thing to uh, appreciate and helpful uh, as you kind of frame how to approach uh, the beginning phases. Or if uh, you're a listener that is already in practice, uh, you know, when you mentor maybe new trainees, or if you have new faculty that are just finishing training. This is uh, helpful as well. But now let's go back to this research idea. Uh, Dr. Katari, you were saying that, you know, research was a, a novel way of, uh, a new way of thinking that you hadn't really been exposed to before. And certainly uh, in all of our ACGME accredited programs, research is an expectation of that. Uh, do you have thoughts on, on how students can kind of maybe more successfully launch into that? Sure. So again, like I think mentorship comes a big way in research because once you transition from med school to residency, you may have no to limited experience of research. Uh, so having the right mentor who can guide you in the right path is important. And then seeking out, like I think for me, it was like I figured out what I'm interested in and then I tried to focus my research on that. Having said that though, it is not like you will just, you may get another opportunities too, which in which you may be putting less effort, but maybe getting more out of it. And I think it is important to recognize those opportunities and grab onto those. And sometimes those opportunities just come out of nowhere. For me, like during COVID time, uh, we had a book club where we were reading WHO Hempath. And then some of the seniors said, hey, do you guys want to come up with like a book for writing like summary of WHO kind? And that was a small thought. And with that small thought, like no, we first published like our first book, which was Ace My Path, Neoplastic Hempath. And then now there is a series of that books. So it can come like you should not miss an opportunity where you see it. It may require extra time and dedication. And that is something you'll have to work out in your schedule. Mm, I like that. Uh, you know, um, I, I think that being open, that being curious, that kind of resonates. That's kind of a, a rolling thread uh, that regular po uh, podcast listeners will pick up on. Uh, something you mentioned there was about the idea of the right mentor. And I'm curious uh, to hear from both of you because uh, you're really in the thick of it. Uh, how do you, I, how do you identify that, that right mentor? Yeah. So kind of speaking from experience, I find that, you know, if you're kind of new to research or even if you've done research projects in the past, it's really hard to kind of get the sense of, who the right mentor is maybe with one meeting or even if it is the right mentor it might not be the right project right so i think it's important to kind of cast a wide net first you know maybe not as hard as it is because we tend to be yes people maybe just say you know i'll get back to you on that and kind of um, play the field a little bit get a sense because a the right mentor is important but also the right project because you need unfortunately because residency is so time bound you need to find projects that are going to achieve some sort of liftoff and you know you don't have time for a magnum opus or a thesis kind of in your residency position 
unless you choose to go on and there are, you know, um, clinician science um, training programs, you know, you can do your PhD, et cetera. But the advice I would give is talk broadly and then um, find smaller projects to start with. And then you can always take on more later on, but find ones that, you know, have a good success of achieving liftoff. Dr. Katari, do you have uh, additional thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. Just like echoing on that, like small projects, I think it's important to have some, that I try to have something on my CV every year mm -hmm. so that it at least keeps me like saying that I'm doing something every year, mm -hmm. whether it's a poster or a case report, like you are making some kind of progress. That is important. And so going back to your question of right mentor, uh, early on, it was more like uh, you, you, you don't really have an idea and you just see what opportunities you are coming for. And like you all, as things are like, you have hard time saying no. So, but now I just try to reflect upon like what my, what, what are the fields I am interested in? And then mentors, like if I'll do, I'll do maybe a small project with someone and then see how I, how our bonding was and like, did I get to learn something? And if I get that feeling, then I'll do a big project with that person and then yeah, just so build, build on that bond. It's awesome. We've been rounding with Drs. Uh, Kataria and Dr. Kubik uh, for optimizing the residency experience. That's optimizing the residency <laughs> experience. Uh, so thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks thank for having so us. This it was, was fun. Yeah. And to all our listeners, thank you for joining us today. We invite you to share your thoughts and suggestions by email to mcleducation at mayo.edu. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe. And until our next rounds together, we encourage you to continue to connect lab medicine and the clinical practice through educational conversations. <laughs>